Hello and welcome back to my little Valhalla. Also known as the workshed, to be fair, but nonetheless the perfect place to regale you with the tale of that time when I was indeed sent to Valhalla to sup with Odin and await the great final battle at the end of time. <laughs> Now, in all seriousness, this story comes from my time living in York and working with the York Archaeological Trust as a, a Viking slash archaeologist. And yesterday, social media reminded me that it was indeed 10 years ago yesterday that I and two other Viking kings were sent in glorious fashion off to the afterlife. Uh, this was part of the York Viking Festival, the Jorvik Festival which every year the, the museum hosts in, in the city uh, limits to celebrate its Viking heritage. And it was a very exciting time of year, every year. Lots of reenactors would come to town, stalls would be set up selling interesting Scandinavian and period goods. Uh, it, was, it was a very busy time in the museum. That, that, that's, for, that's for certain, in so much as you get so many more people coming through, but also lots of reenactors coming through with some fairly harsh banter, it has to be said. Lots of people going, oh, you call that a Viking costume? Mm. But the thing is, the stuff that we were wearing, the Vikings were wearing day in, day out, had to be more durable. Because it's one costume that has to last for years. So so some of the fabrics weren't entirely correct, and some of the, the, the gear wasn't entirely as finickety as it could be. But there were reasons for that, and I think the b actors knew that. They just liked to have a bit of back and forth as they went through, you know. Um, not, not least as well, sometimes you get some very interesting Norwegian people coming through. We're the wheel Vikings, they would say. And you're like, nope, Danes, sorry, wrong Vikings, off you go. But, <laughs> but anyway, it was a great time of year, and 10 years ago it was even better because it was the, the, the 25th anniversary of the Orvik Centre. Uh, Richard Hall was still alive, the archaeologist who headed up the excavation at Coppergate, upon which the museum well, sits and is based, so the reconstruction of what was found is what, what the main focus of the museum was. Um, a, a wonderful uh, member of staff was coming towards his retirement, Time Machine Tony he was known to me as, but he'd had a couple of different roles within the, the, uh, the trust. But when I knew him, he was running the time machine, the thing that people came in through, you know, into the entrance of the museum, it was the first thing that they saw, this guy in a lab coat saying, hello, we're off to, you know, off to, to, to the history. Welcome to Jorvik. <laughs> you're now at the 10th century level of the city, but you're still in the 21st century. So what we've got to do is get you to, back to the 10th. And to do that, we've created a time machine. So, if you'd like to make your way in, please, make your way in and find yourself a seat. Is it scary? Um, <laughs> <laughs> time will tell. <laughs> So I'm not going to do anything. Don't be in a seatbelt. But if anybody is uncomfortable, you're quite welcome. Join the shaking. All right, just stand at the side. So, for the final time, let us all know. Time travel. Here we go. Sing the song. emerge into into Jorvik uh, proper uh, Tony was amazing and 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 it was interesting to see 
this 25th anniversary co co uh, coinciding with his retirement, coinciding with a renewal of the museum as well. Uh, they were they were redoing uh, some of the entranceway and the um, the displays. So there was there was an underfloor element of reconstruction before the time machine, which slightly broke the continuity a little bit because you were going from the dig to the time machine to another place where the dig uh, actually happened as opposed to where it was reconstructed. Anyway, it was, it was, but it, but it, was it was wonderful and it was exciting and it was fun. And uh, at the end of every festival, there's a big battle uh, where, where two groups of reenactors meet, beat the snot out of each other in a field somewhere in and around York. And uh, th this particular year, they wanted to do something a bit different. They wanted to, to open up the, uh, the, the event, the final event of the festival with a film telling the tale of three Viking kings. And I was selected to be one of the kings this year. So uh, we filmed in a place called Merton Park, I believe it's called, just outside York. It's a, it's a place where they have a reconstructed dark age village and a Roman fort and some other bits and bobs. And it's actually the place where I had my stag, do, well, stag and stagette do. I had friends of, uh, from all over the place and male and female at my stag do. And we, we spent the night there with fire and mead and sleeping in the, in the, the long houses. And it was great. But Merton Park is a wonderful place to film this little tale. Uh, so, uh, so here's the video. Uh, hopefully, they won't mind me using it. I have a copy of it on disc that they gave me anyway. So, uh, you know, here we are. Enjoy. It is the year of our Lord 910. The king has arrived in the city of York. His name is Hath. He's a Dane and he is following in the footsteps of many Danes before him. But he is unsure of his welcome here. The people of York are wary of this stranger in their midst. What does he want? And why has he come arrayed for battle? gloom and smoke of the mead hall sit the kings, Eowils and Ivar. They embrace their ally, and invite him to eat. Halfdan devours the meat, the hunger of his belly matched only by his appetite for glory and gold. The twenty ships at his command have raided all over Christendom. Ivar watches and thinks. He is the one who has called this gathering of kings, mindful that his throne at Jorvik might be at stake. <coughs> Eowils is a renowned berserker, a valued warrior on the battlefield and a terror to the Mercians. He has strewn the meadows of the Danelaw with the bodies of the dead, providing rich carrion for the crows. <coughs> and so to the matter at hand. These three kings, Halfdan, Eowils, and Ivar, want to rid themselves of the enemies in the south, where Wessex is growing stronger. <laughs> that 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 was good King Edward the Elder and his Mercian allies have already won significant military victories. The three kings know that their fate will be decided in a show of strength against their enemies, and the strength of the three is unprecedented. With thousands of Viking raiders at their command, the three plan a devastating raid deep into Mercia and Wessex to slaughter and to burn and perhaps to break the ambitions of Wessex for good. And so it is decided. The three swear an oath of brotherhood with burnt offerings to Odin, Thor and Frey.
The three kings sit at the campfire. King Edward of Wessex is in pursuit, but the Vikings are happy that they will have escaped to their own lands long before his arrival. The Danes lay camped on Woden's field. The moon and stars gave forth no light, for the mist lay heavy and chill around, yet from the camp came festal sound, where the golden cups are gleaming bright, for the pagans hailed a revel that night. Suddenly a shout, the foe, the foe. Too late for King Edward is on them. The mist has shrouded his numbers and muffled their tread. They fight and they slay, for the Danes never yield. And mid relics of feasting, the pagans lie dead. And the dragon of Mercia floats over the field. In truth, it was a sorry sight when the mist cleared off the reeking plain. And the sun rose red upon the slain. The stream ran foul amid the wood, and the traitor raven fed her brood with Danish blood that day. There lay King Halfdan, huge of limb, whose front showed many a battle scar, and Eowils and Ivar. So that set the scene. Three kings had died, and uh, the the people mourning the, the the kings at their funeral broke out into a battle. Uh, and it was it was an interesting night actually to be there and to see see this stage. It was played on a screen, and then they had a, a ship that we'd been working on for weeks that was going to be burned as part of the funeral. Although that's a weird somewhat mythical type thing to do it was very much fitting with the nighttime setting as a real spectacle and we'd spent weeks preparing this ship i remember going to a warehouse uh, down a back alley in york uh, it, it, some sometimes a shift works sometimes um after hours i'd just be helping out um the technicians for the museum are wonderful they keep the, they keep the the ride running they keep the the environment working they have a brilliant workshop and in this instance, what we were making was and painting was plywood shields. Uh, and one of the things I'm most proud of is instigating the 3D look for the bosses, the shield bosses in the middle, with three, at least three shades of grey. You know, it's like a light, a middle, and a dark to go that sort of 3D look when it was hung on the side of the ship. And my, my abiding memory of the night was actually some of the, the sort of the internal sort of again this banter between Jorvik staff and reenactors there was a particular reenactors group I won't name them but they're probably the most well-known reenactors group for uh, for post Roman Britain um, in England um, they they insisted that they wanted to be the people who would set off the fire they wanted to have um, uh, one of their guys fire the lit arrow about the ship that would set it up in flames and the thing is we had a guy who had been practicing his archery specifically for this for months in fact he he got into his archery he he told management about it and they went oh yeah brilliant well, let's do that and what was meant to be a really somber single archer you know wait uh, signaling the uh, the the departure of three well, in my case, slightly wild Viking kings uh, into the afterlife became a bit of a weird spectacle because he was there, but the reenactors had said, "Well, we will not take the field." Such official, official and ridiculous language. We will not take the field unless our members set the fire ablaze. So management had to concede on the day of the thing they had to concede and say okay fine you can you can have you can have an archer do it as well or do you know so, so there's going to be two archers we thought our guy and their guy but it turned out actually there were loads of people from this reenactment group i nearly said their name who just went yeah well i want to do that i want to do that i want to do that so so we had i think from memory maybe a dozen archers of varying skills firing uh, lit arrows in the vague direction of this ship some of them missing, some of them hitting the, the sail and falling down. I think actually that was our guy who did that first because he had been practicing. Um, and it became a bit of a farce, actually. It, 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 for me, it was one of those things where um, it was meant to be like, it, well, my funeral uh, had suddenly become this 
let's all fire arrows at the thing in the night. It, it was a, yeah, it was a weird start to that event. So come the kings to the Bifrost Bridge. Come now, says Heimdall, as he turns, the bright silver horn resounding in his hand. Tell me your name, that I may send you across the sky on flames of fire, so that you may come to the Hall of Asgard, in Valhall, where the valiant slain await the day of Ragnarok. So there we are. The time I was sent to Valhalla. And what a wonderful thing to have happened. You know, I look back on that time with such fond memories because it was it was hard work, but it was informative work. It was so important to who I became as an archeologist, but also as someone who presents the past to the public. It was a magnificent focused sort of baptism of fire. Uh, talking to people every day in period costume about a very particular time and place. It was uh, a time just before I was about to get married. I, I was uh, uh, about to move back to the northeast of England, having been to university here to settle down with the amazing Mrs. Soup. And let's face it, I mean, not many people get to say that they've had a Viking funeral. Not least because if you've had a Viking funeral, normally you can't talk. <laughs> it was it was a good time and as I say I remain so pleased to have experienced this stuff and as I sit here now in my little work shed, my little Valhalla what a wonderful tale to be able to tell thank you guys for watching hopefully you've enjoyed this as ever until next time do take care bye bye